The love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We join together this morning in the call to worship. The stars offer their light. The sun gives heat. The planets their gravitational pull. The earth is blooming. All celestial bodies move, relate, and share their qualities to praise you, O God. Along with sun and moon and shining stars, we offer our whole selves today. May our ears, our hearts, our minds, and our actions bring praise to you, O God. Our opening hymn this morning uh, will be a new one. It's one of our creation songs. There will be a very familiar melody, though, right in the middle, and we in invite you to join in when you recognize the tune. a joy to be together in worship. Whether you are here in person, watching on live stream, listening on radio, or later on YouTube, we are so grateful that you are part of this community of faith. We continue to celebrate the season of creation here at Knox, and today, with the entire vastness of the universe, conscious that the cosmos is a sacred space which humans on earth are just a very small but privileged part we join in worship. 
As we gather today, we are reminded that all people are created in God's image and are of sacred worth. God's radical love includes everyone. All are welcome without exception, regardless of age, race, ethnic background, nationality, gender identity, sexual orientation, family or socioeconomic status, educational background, political affiliation, physical or mental ability, faith, history, or life experience. The diversity of God's creation is part of what makes us beautiful. Let us continue in prayer. God of the cosmos, we gather with all creation to worship you. We invite the glittering galaxies in the sky to radiate splendor of your presence. We call the distant domains of space to celebrate with us. We invite nebula, nova, and black holes to thank you for their fascinating formation. We summon that piece of stardust called Earth to pulse with the rhythm of your presence and celebrate your glory in this planet garden. We invite millions of living species to dance with life, the turtle, the toad, and the elephant, the earthworm, the ant, and the dragonfly. We gather with every creature in the web of creation to consciously connect with others in this community called Cosmos. Let us be conscious of our place in the cosmos. In so doing, we remember moments of wonder, sensing the infinite world of space, connecting with endless networks in time, and feeling the mystery of the moment. We confess that we have polluted Earth's atmosphere and cut a hole in the ozone layer. We have turned our greed into global warming. We have ignored our crucial connection with those parts of creation where we live. We loved progress more than the planet. We are sorry. And now we pray in the way that Jesus taught us together, saying, Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and all that will be, our Divine Parent who is among us, blessed be your creation. May your realm be a reality here on Earth, May we become more interested in building your kingdom here and now than in waiting for it to come down from above. Let us share our bread with those who hunger. Let us learn to forgive as well as to receive forgiveness. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the, from the grip of all that opposes life, wholeness, and peace, free us. For ours are the eternal blessings that you pour upon the earth. For all that we do in your love, and all that your love brings to birth, and the fullness of all that will be, are yours now and forever. Amen. Hear the good news, my friends. Since the beginning of days, God has celebrated the emergence of the heavens, rejoiced in the foundations of the earth, delighted in the habitants of the world, loved the face of humankind. And so God celebrates, rejoices, delights in, and loves each and every one of you. Thanks be to God. May the peace of Christ be with you.
If there are any young people who want to join me up at the front here, um, I'm not actually contagious with anything. I just have a sinus infection, so you're pretty safe if you want to come up and sit a little closer to me. Nice to see you today. Yeah, you can just sit right there. That's awesome. Good stuff. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Great to see you. So, I grew up on a place, in a place called Prince Edward Island, and in the winter time, if my mom couldn't find me in the house, she knew where I was. We had a picnic table in the backyard, and it was very dark. We grew up in the country, so there weren't any lights anywhere. It was very, very dark. So I would turn off the back porch light, and I would go out into the darkness and find the picnic table, and I would lie down on the picnic table when it was nighttime, and I would meet an old friend every winter. This is a friend who was actually chased by a scorpion. Do you know what a scorpion is? A little creature that stings people? Yeah, we don't have scorpions in Waterloo. I'm thankful for that. So this is a friend. His name is Orion, and he's being chased by a scorpion. And I would go out and hang out with him in the winter. Here's a picture of Orion, my good friend. There he is. There he is. Every winter, Orion would appear in the night sky. And there's another constellation. This is a constellation in the night sky. Uh, I'll talk about Orion in just a minute. But there's another constellation in the shape of a scorpion. And you never see Orion and the scorpion in the sky at the same time. Never. When one is rising, the other is setting. And when one is setting, the other is rising. This is a, an, old, there's an old Greek story about Orion. Orion was a hunter. That's the story. And if you look at Orion, you see there's a big box on the outside. The, there's a bright star up on the top left. And then it makes kind of a crooked box. Well, that's like Orion's body. And then you can see the three stars that go across on an angle in the middle. That's Orion's belt. And then his sword, his knife, is hanging. It looks like three stars hanging below the belt. Now, there's more stars in Orion, but those are the main stars. So he, he was a hunter, a very brave hunter. Uh, but the story is, uh, someone got angry at Orion and sent a scorpion after him and chased him. And so I'm not sure if the scorpion is chasing Orion or Orion is chasing the scorpion. But anyway, they're never in the sky at the same time. So I would go out and visit with my friend Orion. Do you see that big star on the top left, the one that looks kind of yellow? That star is called Betelgeuse. It's kind of a funny word, Betelgeuse. And Betelgeuse is, think of how big our sun is. Our sun is pretty big, right? Our sun, like he could put like hundreds and hundreds and thousands of Earths in the sun. His sun is so big. Betelgeuse is way bigger than our sun. It is. If you put Betelgeuse in the place where our sun is, do you know how far it would extend? It, it would extend out past Mars. That's how big Betelgeuse is. It is amazingly huge. It is incomprehensibly huge. It is so big that someday what's going to happen is it's going to... Well, stars... Some stars die very peacefully, and some stars die very dramatically. Sometimes the gravity of the star pulls in on itself, and it gets so hot that it explodes in this massive explosion called a supernova, and that star up in the top left is going to explode someday. Maybe tomorrow, maybe in 100,000 years. We really have no idea when Betelgeuse is going to explode. But when it explodes, it's going to be brighter than the moon. Isn't that cool? That is so cool. So the star to the right of Betelgeuse, oh, I should tell you, by the way, that um, uh, Betelgeuse is about 650 light years away. Now, let's think about this for a minute. Imagine you can go around the Earth seven times in one second. Just, can, do you think we can do that? Can anybody do that? Go around the earth seven times in one second? That is so fast. Amazingly fast. That's one second. Imagine how many times you could go around the earth in a whole year. 
That's called a light year. Light travels so fast. So the light from Betelgeuse, up in the top left, it takes 650 years for that light to go into your eye. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. From a long, exactly. So when you look at Betelgeuse, that light left Betelgeuse 650 years ago. You're absolutely right. You're looking at something that's old. So the light that's leaving Betelgeuse today is going to enter the eyes of someone 650 years from now. And in fact, this is kind of strange, maybe Betelgeuse has already exploded. If it explodes today, we won't know for 650 years. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? We're looking into the past. I like that. So there's a sto the, the star to the right, do you see the one to the right, his, his, the shoulder, the other shoulder? That star, I love the name of this star, Bellatrix. Bellatrix. Be you know Bellatrix. Do you ever see, do you ever see Harry Potter? Yes. You ever, yeah, yeah, Bellatrix. Well, nobody likes Bellatrix in Harry Potter. But I like this Bellatrix. This Bellatrix is about 250 light years away. It takes 250 years for the light to reach us. It's a lot smaller than Betelgeuse, and it's also a different color. Do you see it? It's a blue star. Different stars are different colors depending on how hot they are. So Betelgeuse is a cooler star because it's, it's kind of red, and Bellatrix is a, a lot hotter because it's blue. Blue is hot, yeah. You know, that if a star is big enough and after the big explosion that happens, if it's super big, you're right. The gravity will pull in smaller and smaller and smaller until it becomes a black hole. That's exactly what happens. Not all stars become black holes. Our star is not big enough to become a black hole. Our star is pretty small. The sun is pretty small compared to these other stars. It will not become a black hole. This, our sun, when it dies, in about four billion years' time, so you don't need to worry, <laughs> it's going to get big, 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 not nearly as big as, as Betelgeuse. It's going to get bigger, and then it's going to get small, smaller, 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 smaller. There's, it's really cool why that... We can talk about why that happens another time. But anyway, <laughs> there's one more really cool thing I want to show you. So, do you see the sword? And do you see the middle star in the sword that's hanging down below his belt? That looks like a star, but that is actually something really cool. It's called a nebula. Oh, I know. Do, you know what's a ne do you know what a nebula is? What's a nebula? Uh, well, it's, it's super cool. Right on. It's super cool. It's kind of like a universe. It, it's kind of like a mini universe. It's where, it's where there's all kinds of, um, well, we call it dust. It's not really like dust in your house but it's a collection of all kinds of atoms and very, very tiny particles of matter that come together in big clouds. And if those clouds, they, the gravity pulls them together, and what happens sometimes is there's, if there's enough matter and, an, and there's enough pull, then it can create a new star. Yes, that's what happened to the sun. That's exa exactly how our sun got started. Exactly. So I've got a really cool picture of the Orion Nebula, and there it is. Isn't that amazing? This picture was taken by the new telescope that is way, way far away from Earth, called the James Webb Telescope. Know you know it? The, the image, aren't they awesome pictures? Yeah. They're so clear. So do you see all, it looks like colorful uh, wisps. That's, that is like um, hydrogen and helium and other elements that are moving around in space and then they're going to gather together over a billion years and they're going to create new stars. This is, this is about, the Orion Nebula is about 1,300 light years away. So if a new star is formed in this nebula today, we won't know for another 1,300 years. So, isn't Orion, my friend, really cool? I just love, I can't wait. In the fall, I look, I look to the east, because the stars kind of rise and, and fall the same way the sun rises and falls and sets, and the moon rises and sets. The stars do that too. And in the fall, I feel like, I feel like life is good when I see my old friend Orion 
rising in the east uh, on, on a night in the, when it's getting cold outside. And he hang, he's in the sky all winter long. I'd love to go to... So I hope that you go out and see Orion sometime this winter. I hope everybody goes out and sees Orion. And just, just think, wow, it is so amazing. The universe is just so amazing. It's so amazing. Yeah. We're going to sing a song about... It's kind of about the universe. It's about our place in the universe. When we breathe the air, when, we, when our heart beats, it's like, the, it's like the, the, the beating of the sun's heart. It's just, we are a part of this beautiful universe. Thank you, Molly and MC, for the music today. We can sing it together. lovely piece of music. As Courtney mentioned last week, we're, we're resuming our tradition of the shepherd's crook. Would somebody like to carry the shepherd's crook to church? Here, there you go. There you go. You can carry that out, and you can go out this door right here on the side if you want, and you can follow along, join the parade, and we'll see you later. Our scripture reading for today is a responsive psalm, psalm number 148. Let's read together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise in the heights. Praise God, sun and moon. Praise God, all you shining stars. Praise God, you high and above Let them praise the name of the Lord, for God commanded and they were created. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Wild animals and all cattle, green things and flying birds. 
rulers of the earth and all people young and old together. Before I begin, I'd like to offer thanks uh, to my preaching professor, the Reverend Dr. Stephen Ferris, for the inspiration for these reflections today. I have a part of a second scripture reading which I would like to include. This is one you've heard before, but I invite you to hear it again with new ears. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the day, God, rather, God called the light day, and the darkness God called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. In the beginning, we know these words. We cherish these words, these opening lines from the first creation story in Genesis, the first of two very different creation stories. The second creation story is in the next chapter, but the one that I'm thinking about today is the first creation story. This story is a beautiful poem. It's, a, it's a, an ancient hymn, a piece of art intended to inspire us and to move our hearts toward the mystery and the creativity of the Creator. Art does that. Art is not just a matter of the head. Art is more a matter of the heart. It stirs something deep within us. It connects us with something beyond ourselves. In the beginning. I don't think that this story in Genesis 1 was ever intended to be a scientifically or historically accurate description of our origins. Not at all. It's a piece of art. To say that it's not scientifically accurate does not mean that it's not a true story. Perhaps the truth of the story is is that something sacred lies behind the creation of all that is. Or perhaps that a divine purpose weaves its way in all and through all. There is truth in Genesis 1. This story, this unfolding of creation in Genesis, it can point us to an even deeper truthfulness about our origins. I believe that we in the church need to keep being open to having our mythology of creation, and by that I mean our understanding of where we came from, influenced by what science is telling us. The biblical story about creation is about us, yes, but Genesis was never intended to paint the whole picture for us. Our story actually begins much further back in time. The medieval mystic Dame Julian of Norwich once said these amazing words. She said, God showed me a little thing the size of a hazelnut lying in the palm of my hand. I looked thereon with the eye of my understanding, and I thought, what may this be? And it was answered, it is all that is made. And she was right. For according to our best scientists, in the beginning, as much as we can speak of a beginning, everything was a very tiny thing. In a thing much, much smaller than even a hazelnut, a singularity, and all that would ever be, all matter and time and space itself, lay as potential, for lack of a better word, within that singularity. But to say it was there is misleading, 
For the singularity did not float in space. Space itself was within the singularity. And there was no then either, because time itself was within the singularity. But if you could have been there then, you would have witnessed, witnessed a most amazing thing, the Big Bang, the flaring forth, the beginning. And in a fraction of a second, that singularity exploded. But even to say exploded is not the right word. It expanded, and all matter and time and space and energy rushed outward at a mind-boggling rate. Only they did not rush out into space, for space itself was being created in its rushing outward. I know this explanation is far too simplistic. We cannot really understand, but we can stand in awe. In the first trillionth of a second, energy rushed out in a massive inflation, and the universe, as we understand it, began to be created. Now, after about 380,000 years, conditions got cool enough for electrons to partner with protons, and the first atoms were created. Hydrogen and helium was born, and light itself was born. And over the next few billion years, dark matter, which we can't actually see but we know exists, caused these elements of hydrogen and helium to begin to clump together in gigantic clouds. And in places where the gas was particularly dense, these clouds clumped together even more closely until the atoms got so close and so hot through their bumping up against one another that great nuclear reactions began and the first stars were born. Now over the following millions and billions of years, these stars created in the furnaces, in the cores, the centers of the stars, new elements fusing hydrogen and helium together to create heavier elements like oxygen and carbon, iron and calcium. Now at first, these atoms lived within the, the centers of the stars, but then as if giving a sacred gift to the universe, these stars died and some of them exploded in their deaths, scattering these treasures out into the universe. And the more violent the death, the more treasures those stars created and shared. For the very act of exploding created such intense heat that nuclear fusion created even heavier elements like nickel and zinc and gold. These explosions sent new clouds of new particles out into space and sometimes these clouds would begin to clump together again and the process would repeat itself. We cannot understand, but we can stand in awe. Now about 10 billion years into this process of life and deaths of stars, Hidden in the spiral arm of one galaxy, of the billions of galaxies created, a single small star was born. Its birth was the result of the gravitational gathering together of some of the material from stars which had died long, long before. But some of those new elements, which I was just talking about, Instead of gathering into the star, those elements orbited around the star instead. Now the lighter elements, which were not quite as affected by the gravitational pull of this star, they clumped together in orbits far outside the, the distance of the star and became planets, the gas planets we know of as Jupiter and Saturn. Uranus. 
Neptune. But the heavier elements, more affected by the gravitational pull of this new star, they gathered in closer to the star itself and formed rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. And that third one from the sun, so beautiful, land, water, atmosphere. We cannot understand, but we can stand in awe. I once heard a theologian say that the cosmos is a kind of scripture and when I heard those words, my heart leapt with joy. The grand, mysterious story of the evolution of the cosmos is our story. The night sky is scripture. The earth itself is scripture. We cannot fully understand but we can stand in awe. Now, it's usually at this point in the story where we think of as our beginning. In the beginning, we think about the Earth's creation as our beginning. But we see now that our story goes way further back in time. Now, what happened on that tiny blue and green fragile planet, that's another amazing story. The story of life, the gathering, the clumping together of more of those heavier elements to create life. The clumping together of the elements that was, were born in the hearts of stars and given to the universe in grand explosions gathered together in you and in me. When you hear someone say, we are the dust of stars, they are absolutely right. Look at your hands for a moment. Your very flesh and blood. Your hands exist because stars have lived and died. We cannot fully understand, but we can stand in awe. Our story, though, is not just in the beginning. We also hear from the Gospel of John Another creation story, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, this mystery, which we cannot understand, but we refer to as God, was continually at work in the universe until the stuff of the universe could finally become conscious of itself. We are the universe conscious of itself. Let that sink in for a moment. In the beginning was the desire of God to reach out within this cosmos to communicate, to love. And life itself expressed in our case as human beings by a miracle as, as hard to understand as that first miracle of singularity is formed to receive that sacred gift, that sacred love. But how can human beings, such newcomers in the universe, in the cosmos, how can we learn what is truly important about this mystery of life? How can we learn to be in the universe? How can we learn what is truly sacred? How can such creatures, 
isolated in such a remote part of the cosmos, be moved by the mystery and wonder of their beginnings? Well, how can they? And the Word was made flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth. My preaching professor, Stephen Ferris, once told a meaningful story of someone who owned a summer home on an island on the east coast of Maine. The home was, was on a cove right by the ocean. And Dr. Ferris would say that when he stands on the beach in that location, on the near side of the ocean, the far side of the ocean seems incomprehensible. The ocean is just too big, too broad, too mighty for any human being to understand. Of the far side of the ocean, he stands in awe. But where the ocean draws near to him, where it laps up against the shore of his cove, there he can love. Of the far side, he stands in awe. Of the near side, he can love. Maybe Jesus is the near side of God. Jesus, the close, accessible dimension of the depth of mystery which lies beyond comprehension, maybe Jesus is the near side of God. This very moment, this now, is a part of our unfolding story, the big story of the continued evolution of the universe. And we are in that story right now. We cannot fully understand, but we can stand in awe. As we acknowledge the death of Queen Elizabeth II and await the funeral tomorrow, 
Let us pray. Holy God, we give thanks for the life of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, who is now gathered among the faithful who go before us. We pray for the royal family, all who held her closely in their heart, and all who will shepherd nations of people in the grieving process. May you bless and keep the commonwealth and all who wrestle with the complexities of the monarchy and what Queen Elizabeth represents. We pray especially for those who continue to unpack the legacies of colonialism as we work towards right relationships and reconciliation. We pray all this to you while giving thanks for the life of Queen Elizabeth and while celebrating your sovereignty over our hearts. Amen. The life and ministry of Knox Waterloo is full indeed, and we are so excited to be back together in person for so many ministries and for all of the gifts that you share. I'm going to invite Grant Burks forward um, to share a little bit about our Care of Creation team. Good morning. Uh, first, I'd like to express my appreciation to Courtney and Hugh for their celebration of the season of creation these past three weeks the awe of it all. And um, while I'm not certain, I hope not, that we humans can affect the cosmos as we've seen in the James Webb pictures, I know for certain that we're really good at messing up the part of creation that's this planet. Um, I don't think we re need reminding that creation is groaning, as Courtney put it in, I think, her sermon a couple of weeks ago. Literally every day we see weather extremes reported. We see people in trouble. We see people without food. But it does seem that we need reminding about who is responsible for the care of creation. God has explicitly charged us with stewardship of creation, and we need to respond. But what exactly can Knox as a congregation do in response to the climate crisis? I've been thinking about this since Femi and I had our faithful climate conversations about a year ago. And now, uh, although it's not over, COVID is abating, and now climate change is certainly not abating. I think it's time that we, need, that we build an all, hand, all knocks hands on deck approach to responding to the climate crisis. And to do this, we could use the creation care team to facilitate congregational learning and out of that learning action. Sounds biblical to me. I have thoughts about what a Knox Creation Care Team could look like, but not enough time to tell you about it in this minute person slot, which I'm probably going to go over anyway. So I have a sharing proposal. In the next This Week at Knox, look for Knox Creation Care Team heading, and you will be able to read all about it. And then, after considering it, please let me know if you're interested in participating in this team. And I'll be in the parking lot if you're here in the sanctuary, and I'm happy to chat with you about my general thoughts and directions ahead of your reading the more detailed uh, part. But there is one thing you can do right now, or maybe right now after the service. A major outcome of extreme weather is food insecurity, hunger. Pakistan, with its flooding of the agricultural fields, is a current example of that. And a core program for Presbyterian World Service and Development is responding with their food security programs. On October 1st, we have Team Knox participating in Journey for Hope, and that's PWSD's uh, fundraising effort for their food security programs. You can see the details right now in this week at Knox, including if you're cycling, you can do anything you want, but if you're cycling, 
you can get on a separated bike path from here right to the St. Jacob's Market now with the new market trail that's been opening. So that'll be the cycle path for anybody that wants to cycle. But uh, anyway, have a look right now, uh, or after the service, at uh, this week at Knox about the journey for hope. And please consider sp uh, supporting the team and especially joining the team. We're only a team of three at the moment and we're kind of lonely. So thanks very much. Thank you so much. Grant. As Grant mentioned, there's lots of information every week and this week at Knox, so we invite you to subscribe if you haven't already, um, or you can look on our website and see that information as well. Uh, we are looking forward to the beginning of Wednesdays, a new year of Wednesdays at Knox. Um, that will be this Wednesday from 11.30 till 1 with sandwiches, desserts, and refreshments, and the cost is $7, and the speaker um, or not really speaker, but our entertainment <laughs> um, sharing of gifts will be a hue yeah. and a friend. Um, so we look forward to that. And the next day will be the first Thursday of a new Logos year. And this is an intergenerational ministry for children and youth from grades one to 12 and their families and lots of different members of our community and congregation. And we look forward to the return of family time and all ages being together every week. And we are still looking for volunteers and leaders. I'm still looking for worship arts leaders. So if your heart feels called to this, reach out to um, the Logos director at logos at knoxwaterloo.ca. But we look forward to this on Thursday. And uh, an announcement um, from MC. reiterate what's already in this week at Knox, but I know there's a lot of information in there, so sometimes it's hard to take it all in. We're thrilled to have the choir back in person on Sunday mornings. And if you'd like to join us, you're always welcome. Thursdays at 7.30 in the sanctuary, and our two tenors are a little lonely. So if there's any sneaky tenors out there who are hiding, don't hide. Come out on Thursday nights. And, but all voices welcome, and I'll put a bug in your ear if you want to join for Christmas time. We are bringing back a cantata Sunday, so just putting that bug in your ear that if you want to join for Christmas, that's always an option too, but you're welcome anytime. And Cassidy, wave Cassidy, is running the praise band this year. If there's anyone in our midst, we're, we've kind of forgotten who's in our midst or who's new in our midst now that we've been streaming for two years. So if you're of grade seven age, up to about your mid-20s, all those folks are welcome to reach out to Cassidy or me to get information about the Praise Band, which rehearses Tuesday nights at 7.30, right? And they will be live in worship this fall as well. So just wanted to quickly say that. Thank you. Thanks, MC. And I'll invite forward Heather and Lori to share um, a final push with regards to the unconference. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you know, I'm Heather Causey, Lori Carter, and we're the co-chairs of the uh, Future Steering Team, which is a committee of your session. By now, you sh likely have received many notices or announcements about our upcoming unconference being held this coming Saturday, the 24th, here at Knox, from 9 a.m. to 11.30. I hope you're getting as excited about this as we and session are. Since the congregational consultations held last November, session has been working to respond to the feedback and great ideas we heard from you. We are now inviting everyone, age, um, high school age and up, to participate in phase two. And this starts with the unconference this Saturday. The unconference will provide an opportunity for the Knox community to come together informally for the first time in ages and hang out, share ideas, and rediscover the passions that brought us together in the first place. 
The format of an unconference is a great way to facilitate this. An unconference does not have fixed agendas, presentations, keynote speakers, and minutes, as do most meetings or conferences. It's a type of gathering in which the participants determine the topics and then move to different rooms based on shared interests and common ideas for discussion. We encourage all of you to consider coming and joining in as we try to shake the tree and see what falls. Because the unconference will be held here at Knox in person, masking will be encouraged so that more people will feel comfortable attending. If you would like to participate but are unable to attend in person, please let us know. We will try to facilitate a way in which you can engage ahead of and following the event so that we can benefit from your input. We do ask that you RSVP. This can be done by signing the list in the atrium after church or by using the online RSVP link provided in the email sent out this past week and likely in this week's at Knox, Wednesday at Knox, or you could always call the church office, I'm sure. The overarching theme that arose from last fall's con consultations with the congregation was the importance of developing and maintaining relationships through caring, learning, and doing together. Now is our chance to move forward with this. We hope to see you this Saturday. And we invite everyone after worship today to an outside post-worship social time, and that will be just on that side of the building out in the parking lot. It's a great chance to get to know each other and reconnect after the summer. Through God's love, we have been given so many gifts to share as an expression of our gratitude and out of our common concern and need for others, let us give generously through our offering time, talents, and financial resources to support the many ministries of the church. Knox offers many ways to give. E-transfer is the simplest or online, and checks and credit card and cash are welcome in the office. We look forward to some special music.
continue in prayer. Wisdom of creation, wisdom of Christ in whom all things in heaven and earth are created. You carry beauty in the visible and hope in the invisible. All power is humbled in service to you. All things find their fullness in you. Help us as we work towards a place for all creatures and life to dwell in peace and abundance. We lift up those who are broken by institutions, by oppression, by lies and corruption, by sickness and addiction that ravage our dreams of a shared life together. As a community, we seek reconciliation and healing for all. Lord, who spoke and it all came into being, we give you thanks for the wonders you have made. Now we look up and outwards and we see your splendor, friendly white summer clouds and grim daunting storm front. Layers of atmosphere enabling life, protecting and sheltering. The silver of asteroid burn and rarely seen streak of comet tail. The moon reflecting light into our darkness and ruling the tides. The sun giving us light and warmth, anchoring us in space. The mystery, mysterious variety and splendor of close planet neighbors. The brush stroke of our galaxy, its vastness arching across the night. Nebula cloud, quasar and pulsar, black hole and red giant, numerous galaxy swirls that reach us as simple bright dots. Hubble's deep field that marks the extent of our seeing and knowing. We thank you, God, for a wondrous planet home. Connected with a web of worlds we call the cosmos, Christ, teach us to empathize with Earth. Make our spirits sensitive to the cries of creation, cries for justice for the land, the seas, and the skies. Make our faith sensitive to the groans of the spirit of creation, groans of longing for a new creation. Make our hearts sensitive to the songs of our kin, songs of creation from the sea, the forest, and the air. Christ, teach us to care. And all God's people say, Amen. Our closing song for today is a, a, a beautiful piece of music. I made reference in my sermon to Julian of Norwich, who was a 14th century uh, poet and theologian and mystic. And she uh, wrote a lot of, of works. And the, this hymn we're going to close with today is a paraphrase of a Latin script written by Julian of Norwich. Like a rock, God is under our feet. Like a roof, God is over our heads. 
Like the horizon, God is beyond us. Like water in a pitcher, God is in us and in the pouring out of us. Like a pebble in the sea, we are in God. As God has changed your life this day, go now and change the world. Amen. Tu mamina, tu mamina, tu mamina, tu mamina, so send me. I'm Hugh Donnelly, one of the ministers at Knox Waterloo. Thank you for being a part of the worshiping community today. You can find us online at knoxwaterloo.ca, and you are always welcome to call us at 519-886-4150. This broadcast is made possible by you, listeners and friends of Knox, who support Knox's broadcast ministry. Please consider making a donation in gratitude as you are able, and may the peace of Christ be with you.